Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Listening right now. Thank you, Larry Bailey, Michelle Sergio, Kirk Stephenson. Everybody, welcome brand new patrons, Helldiver and Brian. Yay. On this episode of DTNS, AMD's new laptop chips take on Qualcomm, why Google spending more money than ever on a security company is smart, and Shannon Morse lets us know what to worry about with the AT&T data breach. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 15th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. My friends, we got chips, we got breaches, it's... Uh, 19th century me party and right in here. For a second, I was like, potato chips? You actually do have potato chips, but we also <laughs> have silicon <laughs> chips to talk about. Let's start with the quick hits. Roboticist at Yale University have published details in the journal Advanced Materials about soft robots that can sacrifice their own limbs to keep going. Uh, you know, lizard style. A demo shows a soft quadruped getting trapped in a rock and then removing one of its legs to keep going. The reversible joint is self-heated. That lets the robot dissolve the connection, drop the limb, and continue moving. Uh, the limb can even be reattached later if it's recovered. Another video showed three soft robots heating their joints together to fuse the bodies and create a bridge so they could cross a wide gap between tables. Hard robots can do these things too, yes, but these robots use a polymer in the joints that can be melted, pulled apart, and then stuck back together again, which is kind of cool. Slightly terrifying. A Bloomberg that. source claims Apple's sales in India are up 33% on the year through the end of March, and half of those sales were iPhones. That stands in contrast to CounterPoint's analysis that says phone shipments in India are still dominated by feature phones. Smartphone shipments grew 11% on the year in Q1, but 4G feature phone shipments grew 25%. Now, interestingly, entry-level smartphone sales below $100 fell 14%, while premium phones, which are more than $800, grew 44%. A feature phone might cost you less than 18 bucks. Mm, wow, that's a, that's a cheap phone. I get why you might stay on it there. Apple has been approving game console emulators for the Apple App Store, as long as they don't include copyrighted games. You have to provide those yourself. Apple also notarizes third-party apps and app stores in the EU. And UTMSE... Some people joke the SE is for slow edition. We'll tell you why in a second. Is an app that lets you emulate operating systems. So you can play games like old DOS games and stuff on it. Uh, it actually can emulate Windows, Mac OS 9, and Linux. Uh, you have to provide the operating system yourself, of course. At first, Apple rejected the app and rejected notarizing it, saying that it does not support emulating operating systems. Later, it clarified it was just rejecting it from the App Store. There's a lot of confusion about this. But in the end, it has changed its mind. Apple has approved the app, and it will be available for free on iOS and Vision OS app stores and come soon to Alt Store Pal. You will also, of course, have to provide your own legal copy of the operating system. Apple still forbids just-in-time compilation as well. So this is a what you call jitless emulator, meaning it's going to run slower. Hence the jokes about SE being slow edition. <laughs> Android's fa Android Faithful's Michelle Rahman, writing for Android Authority, found that an update uh, found an update to the Jetpack Camera X library in Android 14, which makes it possible for third-party apps to capture capture Ultra HDR images. Ultra HDR is an Android 14 file format that saves SDR and HDR versions of an image in the same file. That means that JPEG HDR images viewable on any device will be available in the camera functions of non-camera specific apps like social media apps. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. So ones that you just want to take a quick snap, you can still get an HDR yeah. image in there. That's nice. Uh, and the Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals has issued a stay on the United States FCC's new net neutrality rules that were supposed to go into effect on July 22nd. That stay will last until August 5th, while court considers legal challenges to the rules, mostly from broadband companies. The FCC has been changing the classification of internet regulation in the U.S. between being an information service, a 
or a telecommunications service, depending on which party holds the executive branch of government. So uh, we're not quite switching away from information service back to telecommunications service yet. Hang in there. We probably still will. All right, AMD showed off details about its Zen 5 processors last week to reporters, and those NDAs have expired Monday, so folks can start sharing what they learned about the Ryzen 9000 Granite Ridge desktop processors and the Ryzen AI Strix Point mobile processors. So the 9000s are the, are the big new uh, desktop processors comp comparable to the 14th gen Intel processors, and Strix Point are kind of comparable to Qualcomm's processors. Shannon, on a scale of one to 1,000, how excited are you? <laughs> well, given that I have to build a new PC pretty soon because mine is slowly dying a sad death, um, I'm pretty excited. And this is definitely going to be a year that I'm going to be paying attention to these CPUs. It looks like they are very powerful and will be perfect for my use cases. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the 9000 processors, but let's start by focusing on the 300 series. Uh, that's the one that will compete with Qualcomm Snapdragon X Elite, and uh, it will power AMD powered Copilot Plus PCs. Those are the ones that Microsoft signs off can have enough flops to run all of their AI functions and things that people don't want, the, some things that people want. Uh, the 300 series from AMD has 50 tops. Uh, that means that it is five more of those, uh, was it trillion operations per second, uh, than the minimum. So the neural processing unit has 50 tops. Um, I guess it's 10 more than the minimum required. Plus, Tom's Hardware says early benchmarks of the RDNA 3.5 uh, integrated graphics uh, is equivalent to an NVIDIA GTX 1070, which I know is eight years old, but for integrated graphics, uh, not bad, right? Um, the first laptop with the Ryzen AI 300 processor to be announced so far is the HP Omnibook Ultra Copilot Plus 14-inch laptop, which promises 55 tops from the same NPU that AMD says only gets 50 tops, so they managed to squeak out a few more, apparently. Uh, also promises 21 hours of battery life, so that's another thing ARM processors give you is long battery life. This AMD mobile processor promises long battery life. Uh, it will not launch with the Copilot Plus features. Uh, it will get them in a free update once Microsoft makes them available. So you, for a while, even if you buy this laptop, it won't have actually be a Copilot Plus laptop. The Omnibook Ultra ships in August, starting at $1,449.99. Uh, Shannon, uh, what do you think of maybe getting a laptop with a 300 series in it? Oh man, I just bought a laptop. Aha. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> well, I am pretty excited about this. The, I believe the HP Omnibook Ultra Copilot Plus laptop is going to be the first one that is not ARM, but will come with Copilot in that future uh, update. So that's pretty exciting because I am looking forward to being able to compare what's what Ryzen is offering as well as what we're getting with the ARM PCs, the Snapdragon X Elites. So it's going to be really interesting from like a reviewer's perspective of how these process, how these units work work um, versus each other. How's the processing? How's the battery life? How are the AI capabilities? So that's going to yeah. be really fun. Yeah. Can these x86 processors actually compete with the efficiency of the ARM processors? Uh, yeah. Can they bring some of their legacy advantages in, in running Windows native uh, to this? Roger, overall, I mean, uh, the Ryzen 9000 and the 300 uh, announcements are fairly light. Uh, we're still waiting for a lot of details, but we are seeing, uh, even though we don't have prices, we're seeing a ship date of July 31st. You know, what's what's the top line on these? The top line is that uh, with at least with the Zen 5, AMD is pushing both performance but also higher efficiency. Like they're, they're expecting at least 15% more instructions per cycle uh, with the Zen 5 over the Zen 4 series processors, um, which is very important because as you get higher performance out of these chips, they generate an enormous amount of heat. And anything that mm -hmm. uh, cools that down somewhat is better. In fact, they uh, AMD is working on a new curve uh, voltage curve app that will allow you to shape the the voltage if you're an overclocker so that you can manage yet one more uh, a piece of of your overclocking puzzle so you don't make your system unstable because it gets uh, un unbearably uh heated inside the case with the 300 
I unfortunately it's very, as you said, very light on details. And I'm very curious to see, as Shan mentioned, how well it does with the Copilot Plus feature set when Microsoft does release it, because it does sort of pit this odd thing between ARM, uh, an ARM-based uh, Windows machine, and x86, especially if Intel uh, uh, falls through on what they were promising uh, later this year, um, where you have like, well, if, if I already have an x86 machine, and there are x86 options that offer me the same NPU, or at least NPU performance, why not go with that? Why risk it on an entirely new platform? So uh, it's it's going to be very uh, it'll be very interesting to see. Little game of chicken going on with the pricing not being announced too. Yes. Like I think they don't want to give <laughs> they don't want to tip their hand to Intel. Uh, eventually, everybody's going to have to say what their prices are. But uh, we we are not getting the NDA lifting on the benchmarks of these yet either. We're just seeing Geekbench results kind of sneak out. Uh, is what Tom's and hardware saw. So we'll probably get that NDA lift. Then we'll get the pricing announcement closer to July thirty first. And and you know the N Nvidia GTX ten seventy eight years old, but still a pretty potent card if you're not if you're in. The 1080 for integrated gaming. graphics, yeah, yeah. yeah. especially no, for yeah. integrated for for the longest time, we had to sit with a j just barely adequate, yeah. Well, Google is making a surprise and uh acquisition that you might not believe, but is its biggest acquisition yet. A lot of people are making a big deal out of the fact that it is going to spend 23 billion dollars to acquire a company called Wiz. W I Z. Uh, that's just shy of twice what it paid for Motorola back in the day. They paid twelve point five billion for it. Uh, it no longer owns Motorola, in case you were wondering. Uh, it would be equivalent, uh, pretty close anyway, to what Cisco paid twenty eight billion for security company Splunk earlier this year. So it's the going rate for buying a big enterprise uh, security company. It will, of course, face antitrust scrutiny, but in my opinion, buying a big enterprise security company, probably not high on the list of what trust busters are worried about. Uh, so while it'll face that scrutiny, it might not be as big of a deal for Google to buy Wiz. Uh, you may also be ask, what, <laughs> in fact, does Wiz do? Uh, it was founded in 2020, specializes in cloud security. So it's an enterprise services company that identifies and removes critical risks between cloud environments, which is a big deal right now, especially when you have all these supply chain attacks out there. Uh, you want to be able to identify those risks and stop them before they spread. It already sells its services to Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, and to Google. Uh, it brought in $350 million in revenue in 2023, and that's been rising ever since. Uh, it's a very fast startup that is making revenue. I don't know if it's profitable, but it's certainly on its way to it. Uh, so it's a good business. No wonder Google wants to pay that much money for it. And it's a business that kind of fits in, Shannon, with Google's good reputation in the security research community. I absolutely agree. Uh, Google has been really known, especially in the past few years, just from my own understanding uh, with Google Project Zero and with a lot of the cybersecurity researchers and experts that they have hired internally, they've been doing some major strides to make sure that they have good security. And now I will mention too, security is very different from privacy. So people see mm -hmm. Google as not very private conscious when it comes to consumers, but they see it as a very security conscious company and they definitely do. So the fact that they're uh, purchasing Wiz is an extremely smart choice when you see the comparisons that we have for cloud options currently. Yeah. And, and, the privacy issues with Google are always in their consumer facing stuff, usually related to advertising, right? Collecting data yes. around you. The security reputation is very research oriented. Uh, and this company is not very consumer facing. This this is not something you are going to take advantage of as a Google customer, unless you get Google Cloud and you know that your small business is protected by this kind of enterprise level security you couldn't afford otherwise, perhaps, right? Uh, exactly. I, I think it would be smart for Google to continue to operate Wiz in a way that sells security to its competitors like Amazon and Microsoft, though. I really think they should, because right now there has been a lot of information, uh, like you had mentioned earlier, about these kind of attacks that are 
hitting cloud industry, cloud infrastructure. Uh, we have Amazon AWS, and we've seen all sorts of cybersecurity news around leaks and hacks that have happened there. So if they can really push this as being like a security-centric um, and forward-facing cloud uh, cloud data option, then I think that people will really go for it. Yeah, I th I, th I think that people often are wondering what Google will do with advertising money declines, including many people within Google, uh, because it is still the vast majority of their revenue. Cloud is one of the things that they could rely on to make money. It's a growing business, but they're well behind Microsoft and Amazon. Amazon, of course, being the big leader here. Microsoft pretty close in there, and Google's a distant uh, maybe third, maybe fourth, if you count Oracle. In those cases, it's often smart for a company to sell the thing to the leaders uh, that makes them better. Even though that competes with you, you can make money off your competitors by selling them a platform, right? That's that's what Amazon did when it created AWS. It was hosting its own cloud stuff uh, to make to, to bring down costs, and it decided to just yeah. start hosting everybody's content. Uh, I could see this becoming a bigger business for Google than Google Cloud itself, potentially. Huh, that that just made me like brainstorm something about this. I wonder if the fact that they are introducing this cloud security, because as a YouTuber, I use YouTube as free data storage in the cloud uh -huh. on Google ser server. So I wonder if this is going to help with security for their other platforms like YouTube or like Gmail. I, I have a feeling it might be, I wonder if they were thinking about that when they purchased Wiz. They probably would. It's so expensive. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, they obviously valued it enough to to spend <laughs> to, to promise to spend twenty three billion dollars on it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting thought. There, there are probably a lot of other ramifications like that uh, mm -hmm. that that could could reverberate around in the Google verse uh, and 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 bring a lot of security to a lot of other people. So, I re I really do think. Uh, the size of it is only interesting in so much as it tells you how much Google thinks it worth or mm -hmm. when you think about the Cisco money, how much a security company in this age of constant supply chain attacks is worth. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so supply chain attacks in themselves and the the value that we're seeing them like being re the data being resold at has increased over time. So if if they are adding more money into like building a secure infrastructure, that's that's going to be a smart way to do it. I mean, we really need that security in the very near future. In yeah. fact, we need that security right now. And don't forget Google bought Mandiant a couple of years ago too. Uh, and that's we, right. And and when we see Mandiant making news or, or commenting on on security or working with companies to solve breaches, uh, I think I think it gets forgotten that that's that's Alphabet, that's Google, that's that's Google security. <laughs> so Wiz and Mandiant are probably going to be you know packaged together um, in, in a lot of ways. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 10 years from now, we might be saying, you know, Google used to be more of an advertising company, now more of a security services company. Are they becoming like an IBM yeah. or something? Like just becoming an enterprise company. Given what kind of privacy regulations we are seeing uh, in Europe and then here in America, that might be the case. They might be trying to change their platform into something that's more security. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just I don't see this being an antitrust issue. Obviously, it will be scrutinized, but I I think they'll probably be allowed to buy this uh, because there are lots of security companies out there. It's not like they're going to be dominating the enterprise security uh, business with this. Uh, and again, I, I think the antitrust folks are, are more concerned with consumer facing stuff, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a different thought on that or anything we have on the show, uh, or if you have a supporting thought where you're like, you know what, I think you're right. And here's why. Uh, either way, anyway, get in touch with us on the social networks. We're at DTNS show on X. We are at DTNS show at mstdn.social on Mastodon. We are at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok and at DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram and Threads. 
We mentioned the AT&T data breach on Friday. If you missed it, uh, the short version is that through compromised third-party accounts from Snowflake, company that was providing this, another supply chain attack, uh, someone was able to get access to AT&T call records between May 1st, 2022 and October 31st, 2022 for nearly all of its customers during that time. Uh, so these are metadata, lists of phone numbers and what numbers they called, not the content, not the content of the calls, not the content of the text messages, but text messages and phone calls placed. Uh, there might be the ability to tell location if cell towers were used. Cell tower placement could approximate location. Monday, Wired sources added to this story, reporting that on May 17th, AT&T actually paid an attacker $370,000 worth of Bitcoin to delete that customer data. They went through a third party who brokered the transaction and got video proof of the deletion. Somebody who does this and was assuring AT&T, no, we're pretty sure that they have in fact deleted the data, but... I'm sure Shannon's going to tell us that may not be the end of the story. Uh, Shannon, do you do you think this data is gone? And and also, should AT and T have paid? We that's usually bad practice to pay the ransom, right? Uh, yes, it's bad practice. I don't know where why AT and T thought this was a good idea, but apparently they did. So yes, they did. Uh, what the reports are saying is that they did pay the the cyber malicious actors in order to delete the data. But the problem is we we don't know for sure if that data was entirely deleted. Like, yes, these uh, attackers could say that they deleted the data. They could give them proof. They could give them a screen capture. They could show them wherever the data was deleted from. But that doesn't say anything about whether or not they copied the data. How long in, did they have to delete this data previous to the or uh, uh, later after the discovery was made. So there's a lot of time frames there that we also don't understand fully that AT&T could be a little bit more transparent about. And we currently just don't have that information. And on top of that, this is from May. So it's, Jul it's July now. So why did it take AT&T so long to give us this information about this happening if they had already paid them off back in May? That's a yeah, very long time. A lot, a lot of the reasons that you would delay is for law enforcement investigations, which could still be part of this, uh, or because you're trying to confirm the data is real and you don't want to panic and tell people stuff was taken and then find out, oh, actually it was not. Uh, and those are legitimate reasons. However, do you pay $370,000 if you don't think you're sure the data was taken? Like, not a lot of money for AT&T, I guess, but, but still, it's like you said, bad practice. Yeah, it's definitely bad practice, and it gives more of these groups, these malicious actor groups, a reason to go after other companies as well, because they see these huge payouts for these very, very popular and very like news-centric uh, hacks happening, and they decide, oh, I should try that too. And a lot of groups have these abilities in order to expose this data from all sorts of different brands. So what's to stop them if they see a really decent payout like this? Yeah, what yeah. is going to stop future ones from happening? So that's why a lot of government regulations, a lot of agencies recommend that you should not pay attackers, even if they're going to promise to delete your data. Yeah. Let's let's say because it's not it's not as impossible as some might think uh, that these uh, these actors did delete the data. Right. And they no longer have a copy of the data. That doesn't mean even if they're above board, which I know you may not believe they're above board and that's fair. But e even if that was above board, that doesn't mean somebody else didn't copy it, too. Somebody didn't find a bit, 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 a piece of it. So you're not really <laughs> guaranteeing that it you never is, know. In, you know, it's an infinitely copyable medium. So it, it's, it's hard to be ever completely sure. How many times have you found something you thought you deleted and it was in a backup somewhere too? Like sometimes you think you deleted it and you haven't deleted it. Um, all of that said to say, look, this information might still be kicking around somewhere. If it was, uh, what, should AT&T customers or anyone these AT&T customers might have called during that time period, because those numbers are logged too, what should they be worried about? 
So, so this brings up what, what was stolen, which we already know, and what are the potential risks of the data that was stolen? So there could be a potential risk of social engineering. If somebody finds out your phone number, then they could social engineer you in a, a, like phishing attacks. That's extremely, extremely common whenever phone numbers get leaked. Uh, your phone number also exposes other data too, because people can plug in this information, your phone number into like a data broker website, and they can find an entire data set of information about you. That could be your home address and your first and last name, your kids' names, like all sorts of information can be found just from one little piece of data. So if you're looking at it by itself as, oh, my phone number's out there, I guess I'm screwed. Like, yeah, that's that's just one piece of data, but it can be used to find additional data about you from previous hacks and previous leaks because it, you have to look at it as like a holistic attitude as opposed to just one AT&T hack. It's all the hacks over the course of history. Uh, there's also the potential of SIM swapping too. And that's all always right. a really serious risk when it comes to somebody knowing your phone number and knowing your carrier and being able to plug that information into a data broker and being able to social engineer a potential like AT&T customer service rep into them thinking that they're call they're actually talking to you so they could switch your your phone number over to a hacker's phone and be able to pretend to be you and potentially log into other accounts. So if you use your phone number for um, verifying your information on any other platforms online, you should change your passwords. You should definitely think about adding two-factor authentication, especially like physical hardware security or uh, six-digit code apps. There's plenty of them to choose from online. And be extremely aware of phishing scams. Uh, even if you think you're getting a text message from somebody that you know, you should pay attention to what they're asking about and see if it's yeah. contextual to actual conversations that you have. Because somebody can spoof a phone number and make it look like you're getting a text message from your mom or from your sister. So and it's this data really would show crucial. which numbers call you most often. So that gives them a yeah. leg up in knowing who to impersonate. Exactly. Yeah. They have all this data and, and it's, it's much more serious than it looks when you start digging into like thinking like a hacker and what kind of things they could potentially do with this information. So you do have to be careful. And I think the main thing is just protecting your accounts and making sure not to fall for social engineering. Yeah. Uh, finishing up, Londog uh, had an interesting thought. Uh, is there any information that AT&T and law enforcement could glean by paying the ransom. Is that, mm. is that a thing? Cause they did talk them down. They were being asked for a million dollars. They only paid 370,000. Can you like figure out which wallet they tell you to send yeah, it that's to? What Cause I was you're playing thinking. a Bitcoin, anything like that. Cause a lot of times these wallets are encrypted or in some way they are, they're kind of hidden or obfuscated so that it's really hard to figure out who they belong to. But yeah. I know that government, agencies have some way, obviously I'm not the person doing it, but I know they have some ways of discovering where these wallets are located and figuring out who's behind them. So yeah. it's, it's entirely potential that by paying it, maybe that was their plan. Maybe they are going to plan to, uh, uh, continue trying to figure out who was behind it. Which, and again, I'm not trying to defend AT&T when I say this, uh, but it could explain why they took long longer to tell people about it is that they didn't want to tip the hand that they were investigating that sort of thing. So hard to say, but bad, uh, a bad breach, worse than just your, your run of the mill, uh, breach, not as bad as it could have been, you know, it's, but it's above five in a scale of one to 10, <laughs> right? It's, it's, yeah, it's better than it could have been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is just phone numbers, but also as Shannon just well explained to us, phone numbers can be used for a lot of things. So be careful out there. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Michael was among those who responded to Roger's Patreon column uh, on our Patreon on Thursday called Work From Home Meets Globalization. Uh, Michael wrote, I see lots of jobs that require one to be in the Americas time zones or Western European time zones, but not Asian time zones. If the big cut companies do decide to hire Indian programmers, for example, they will often require that they be awake during California business hours, which is not healthy for the workers. Uh, Roger, that, that's a great point, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mentioned in the comments of that uh, column that uh, I, I neglected to expand on the, the time zone. I actually had a, two sentences on it, but I, I left it at that. 
the time zone thing is actually one of the more attractive aspects of hiring abroad because if especially if you're a company that works uh, and you need stuff done in the time that your customers are sleeping and you also have to be be in their time zone and sleeping, you can have people working on whether it's some sort of back end uh, work or even rolling out new features. Um, it's it's really beneficial, especially since so many couple companies these days are global in reach, having a workforce that's equally at home in different time zones. Um, and even if they have to do it at like 1 a.m. their time uh, is a, a benefit yeah. as, long, as well as lower prices. Good. Well said. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, Shannon, uh, for being with us. Uh, if folks want to find more of what you're doing these days on the web, where should they go? YouTube.com slash Shannon Moore, spelled just like my name is. I recently did a video about uh, covering all the new stuff from Samsung Galaxy, including all the new AI features. Uh, check that that video out if you're interested in pre-ordering any of those new things. I am going to be reviewing them on my channel as soon as all those new, new products get shipped. So I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, NATO, yes, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is among the many organizations that invited influencers to its event. In this case, the NATO summit, uh, you know, the one where all the world leaders got together and talked about their mutual defense. If you're exasperated by just hearing me say that, uh, if you're one of the people who's like, oh, influencers, I'm just tired of hearing about influencers, uh, you're going to want to listen to this because Shannon's going to help us understand why, why are organizations turning to influencers? Does it actually work? Stick around. We're going to talk about it. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about mammoth DNA preserved in 3D. Big science news with Dr. Nikki Ackerman. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>